Friends, comrades, fellow admirals, I am Admiral Andre and I welcome you back to Kerbal Space Program Sandbox. I think this is the fifth episode now. Um, I tend to lose a little bit of track because I record some other things in between. But there we go. Um, since the last time that uh, we launched our uh, lunar flyby, or lunar flyby I should say, I again went back and made some small changes to the probe. Just, uh, you know, I couldn't help myself. So let's just go have a look at that. Okay, so let me just load it up. And that was, of course, the Luna 3, I think. Let's just have a look. It should be. Yes, that's the Luna 3. That's the one that I made some small changes to. So if I just take away all of the fairings and all of that, we'll see it is still exactly the same. But all that I did was I added some more solar panels to the bottom here. There used to be those gaps in between. So I would put it in 6 symmetry and uh, just put 2 of those. So there's 12 on the top and 12 on the bottom but in this sense it actually looks very interesting because it has these sharp edges and things it, it looks kind of nice actually much better than having those gaps in between then the other thing I did was if you remember the pictures from last time that we looked up the upper area also had solar panels but just really on the very bottom edge and a bit further up so it was a very thin little ring of solar panels. Now I can't recreate that, but the best I could do was to clip this just slightly into the uh, hemisphere up here so that it has like this blank area in the middle. Of course it still overlaps and so on, but I think this looks really nice actually. So the other thing that I did was instead of using the, uh, let's just find them quickly, the size, what is that called? An accelerometer. Uh, instead of using that at the top like that and at the bottom, I just used these uh, surface scanning modules. Of course, we're not using them now to scan for resources. This is purely for appearance. And I just put two at the top and two at the bottom. And I think they really do look very nice. Certainly much better than the uh, accelerometer. At least, again, for visual purposes. So I think that actually makes the Luna 3 now, or this was the third mission of the Luna probe uh, family, that makes it look a lot more interesting, I think. So the next step really for me now, and I, and I also just confirmed the camera is situated here on the bottom. Uh, these other things are like uh, sun tracking probes and uh, they, they just basically orientate the craft in space by using various stars and so on. And uh, of course there are other scientific instruments as well. But anyway, so this is the camera and I think it actually fits nicely because it has this sort of a lens effect there. But now for today I have two things in mind. And the first thing is we've got to use this. I mean, there's the thing of redesigning it. We have to see it in action. And I think the first thing that we really can do with this is since we have two moons, we can have another moon flyby. And of course that will be for Minmus. And even though Minmus doesn't always keep one side to Kerbin, and therefore from Kerbin we really can see what it looks like anyway, it's so far away we want a closer look. So we're going to send now what will be Luna 4. Or oh, actually, would this be Luna 3? We did the one, it failed. Let me just go back to the list here. I'm not going to do anything. I just want to see. So there was the Luna 1, that was the first impactor. There was the Luna version 2, which was the one that I also created after I ended the recording, and that was another impactor. What was the Luna 2 again? That was the one that we used last time to, to do the flyby. So now it will be actually 1, 2, 3, and 4. So the numbering wasn't quite right. So this is actually Luna 4 now. But oh well, there we go. Let me just put this back down quite low here and just confirm that all of the staging is correct. I think so. So again, I'll put this updated version in the Dropbox, so if you would like to uh, have a look at it, you're more than welcome. So I think for this I'll do the same thing that I did before, just because we've seen the launch now of the R7, I'll just again 
uh, fast forward it with some music again from the YouTube library. I just pick something random that seems to sound nice and uh, there we go. So let's just wheel this out uh, onto the launch pad quickly. There we are. Now, uh, basically just the usual the launch and uh, from there I'll just have to uh, jump back in and then uh, we'll discuss the approach to Minmus. So, see you in orbit. And there we go, a failure. Definitely a suboptimal ascent. I turned way too quickly and uh, there's no way I can salvage this now. So Luna 4 is a disaster. Oh well, occasionally we have to have disasters. I mean, if we look at history again, there were so many of them, especially in the early days. There was also a slight problem actually with the separation of the boosters. I think one of the fins actually hit the main core stage as well, but anyway. So that's that's it for this one. We can actually just uh, fast forward and watch it crash into the ocean. Then I'll just try again and meet up with you, hopefully in orbit that time. Okay, so not a perfect launch again, but certainly much better and we should have enough fuel to fly by Minmus. We have 945 meters per second and I think we'll need about 900 perhaps. So this will have to be planned quite perfectly, but I think we should manage it. Let's just see, where is Minmus at the moment? So I think really we are reaching the limits of what the... Uh, current R7 can do. Of course we downrated it a bit because of the uh, removal of the fuel from the boosters, but uh, again we pretend now this is just what the uh, 
current setup can achieve. It wasn't meant for interplanetary travel. Okay, that is too late, so it won't be there by that time. Let me just select it as a target. Luckily now we have the setting of always being able to see the closest approach. That is so much better, it makes life so much easier. And we should actually be able to meet it right on the ascending and descending nodes, or very close to it. There we go, so that's 900. My guess was almost spot on. So let's see how close we'll actually be uh, passing by Minmus. We're hoping for a reasonably, a reasonably close approach. So let's focus the view and actually just try to uh, play with it like this. Oh, that's a nice one. And it was only two meters per second more. Let's bring it a bit closer. 29,000. I wonder if we'll be able to achieve this exactly because the separation of the probe from the upper stage will still give us a few meters per second. So let's not overdo it because that will kick us lower then. So that should do. Let's actually see if we can now... Uh, so about 1 minute 9 seconds, so I would say 34 seconds before the node we have to start burning. Which is luckily not a long wait. Do not overdo this one. Okay, the problem here is also, as soon as we start burning, we're going to have to move towards the node there. So I'll just actually... Okay, we're on time. Let's move, let's move, let's move. Now that will also cost us. And it's still locked to prograde. That will mean, of course, that the maneuver won't be exactly as planned, but still, hopefully close enough. If we have to restart the upper stage again, we can do that. Eleven, ten, nine, eight, five, four. Whoa, way too much. Now it's a problem because I can't reverse or, you know, reverse thrust. So I have to actually now turn around again. That was a bit too over, overdone. So we have 25 meters of delta V left, which is uh, not a lot, but it's actually perfect for the mission. So uh, perfectly designed in that sense. Just I think from now on, and, and, and I have something in mind, but we really should have some kind of control on the upper stage from now on thrusters or uh, RCS of some kind because it's slightly difficult to maneuver. What was that? Was that the thing now? Okay, wait a minute. Something is here. Can I just... There we go. There's definitely a moon encounter in there somewhere. So right now it's passing at 33, but on the other side, I won't mess with that. I don't care about that. So if I actually separate now, let's hope. 34. Oh, it's perfect. There we go. Perfect. And we had only a few meters per second left in the tank anyway. So this was the perfect use of our fuel. Very nice. I might as well turn the SAS off because it is useless since there is no reaction control system or uh, monopropellant. Just extend all the antennas and... Uh, now of course in real life we would want the camera pointing towards the moon when it passes there, but I don't have that kind of control. And I also saw actually on the Wikipedia even, they have a... for the previous one, the... Uh, actual moon flyby, they have a trajectory to show that the uh, 
Lunar probe actually went by twice. It used the moon as a gravity assist, but anyway, we still flew past, so I won't mad m bother about that. And actually, I'm thinking now I did make a bit of a mistake now with the naming, because I'm naming this after real probes, and I don't know what the Lunar 4 probe was. That was a different thing now, so we should just call this again the, I assume, the Lunar 3 or 2. I'll just have to look it up again. I forgot already. Anyway, this uh, flight is going to take a bit of time, so uh, I'll just speed it up again, and when we reach Minmus, we can admire it close up. So where is Minmus now? Hmm. There's Kerbin. There we go. So let's see how it uh, passes by. Well, and there we are out of the sphere of influence already, so let me uh, just exit here. I see now it looks like, if we just have a closer look, yes, the probe is going to re-enter Kerbin's atmosphere and burn up, so it had a short life, and I, I, I saw now in the flyby the camera was pointing completely away from Minmus, so anyway, we'll pretend there was some kind of way to turn it around. This is just uh, sort of for the visual effect, I guess. And for the fun of it, you know, recreating a few things in a Kerbal style is uh, always an interesting prospect. So let's go home now and begin the second phase of this video. And it's evening here now at the Space Center. Uh, I love the night sounds that they actually included. So that's actually a good way to then segue into the next part of the video. So, actually I remember I was saying last time I wanted to look at the Atlas Booster, and I'm thinking I'm not going to do that in this video. It would be better to move on to Venera 1, and since we've now flown past the moons and so on, I've actually went ahead and already looked up a lot of the information, so if we just go back to uh, the internet quickly, there's Audacity again. Um, yes, so where are we? Venera 1. Um, I should actually open up the timeline again. Just so we have a look. So the first uh, artificial satellite then, that was the Luna 1 uh, restart. So that was the first lunar spacecraft. That was the attempted impactor anyway. The first to actually impact was Luna 2. Now we've been recreating the Luna 3. And uh, obviously the, the one that we just did now was also actually an extension of Luna 3. So I guess we could have called it Luna 3B, since it's still trying to recreate that. Now this one here, the first animals and plants returned alive from space, Belka and Strelka. Let me just open that for interest sake. Sputnik 5. Sputnik 5 was actually, I think, a Vostok capsule, but instead of, yes, the Corable Sputnik. I remember that from Buzz Aldrin, Space Program Manager. This is really just a Vostok. There we go. So, in, in anticipation of the, you see, it paved the way for the first human orbital flight. So, they put some animals in there to see what would happen. Now, I want to wait first with the, with the Kerbal missions, you know, the manned missions. So let's just skip this one for now, and go into, now see I've lost all control here, okay. Uh, to the next one, which is Venera 1. But now I'm thinking maybe it would be better, but no, let's, let's stick to the schedule here. Just because, even though 
really the rocket that was developed for the Sputnik 5 or the Kurabal Sputnik had an impact on the Venera 1 and we'll see why in a second. So this one is really the first one to pass by Venus but it had a bit of a problem. You can see there's Venera 1 and there's Venera 1 again because that's when it was launched. It did the first planetary flyby of Venus, of course, but it they lost contact with it long before it reached Venus, so it's partly a failure. But anyway, that's still something to kind of recreate. Now, this is also the first launch for, uh, from Earth orbit of upper stage into heliocentric orbit, so we're leaving the sphere of Kerbin. The first mid-course corrections and spin stabilization, I won't worry about that, but that just sort of means also I might need to put some uh, reaction wheel on the thing just to help us. So if we now look at the Venera 1, there is an image of Venera 1. Um, okay, it's not the best image, but still. We can see here it had a cylinder on the bottom, and then it gets narrower and then it has another one of these Sputnik kind of hemispheres at the top. It also has two solar panels and this very large antenna, which of course what I like about 1.2 KSP is that we also need that now, so that's something we'll be definitely looking at. So the Molnia was actually the rocket that they used for that one. If we just look here somewhere it says spacecraft launch there, using a Molnia carrier rocket from the Baikonur Cosmodrome. So I went ahead and looked that up, the Molnia here. Again, I know now each time they did change it, somewhere it says that this one had a slightly bigger diameter, but I can't change the diameter by just a few centimeters of the booster. I mean, we have only three options in terms of the diameter, so we'll just work with the one that we've got. So we'll say for all intents and purposes, the lower stages will remain exactly the same. But you can see it has a much longer upper stage here. And then of course the fairing covers the whole upper area and in there is another stage. So let's just go and look again. You see there's another Kerbal. Anything, like, like I said, anything space related, there's a Kerbal version of it somewhere. So here is now the Molnia 8K78. So this is the older Molnia. You get a Molnia M and a Molnia L as well. So uh, essentially again the same thing but just better I guess. So with this one, actually this is not a very clear picture. So down here, as this is again astronautics. They always have good information. Here we can see it very nicely. So we have the same kind of lower configuration, exactly the same. Then it has the upper stage here, much longer, and it seems to have two engines, but it's actually four, and I'll show you why in a second. Then it has the upper stage again, and I'm thinking it looks again like that toroidal tank thing that we saw before, so we can actually just reuse the upper stage that we've already got. We just need a new mid-stage, essentially. And they just compare it to the proton, which we will get into sometime in the future. Now they say here, for example, stage 0, of course, was the boosters. Stage 1 is the core stage. Then you get stage 2, which I'm now interested in. It says number of engines 1. But I looked it up. This is the RD0108. And if we just look at the images, there were some weird things coming up here, like, I don't know, wallpapers or paints or something, and a fish and a shoe, <laughs> but it, it did have some pictures as well. And you can see it actually has four engines, obviously it's, it's just four nozzles of the same engine. And then it also had these four little thrusters on the sides. So recreating this will be a bit of a challenge. We'll see if it's possible, it should be, but uh, anyway. Then... Actually, getting back to the Venera now, there is a decent image of Venera. You see now, again, clearly it has the cylinder on the bottom, then it is sort of narrower, but it's very, I don't know, it's a bit, you know, unclear. Then it's this hemisphere on the top, which they said was actually pressurized, a pressurized sphere. This was uh, a Soviet pennant uh, designed to float on the putative Venus oceans after the intended impact. So this was an intended impactor, I guess. Uh, I don't know if we're going to actually impact it. Let's just do a flyby, then later we can do an impact. So Venera 1 had no onboard propulsion system, but then as a, on the same token, I found another source 
at NASA actually that says it did have an onboard engine. So let's just find that quickly. So yes, it says it has a large high gain antenna. Then uh, somewhere here. Yeah, Venera 1 had an onboard mid-course correction engine, although this was not labeled in diagrams. So I'm guessing we're going to use RCS for this. It says here attitude control was achieved through the use of sun and star sensors gyroscope. So we just put a reaction wheel on and call it a gyroscope and nitrogen gas jets and now that's the RCS so we'll put an RCS or a couple of them on the bottom and say that's our mid-course correction engine so then it speaks about the rest which I certainly encourage you to read up about so maybe this series can also be a way of learning a bit more about space history I don't know Sputnik 3 is another one that we can do this one actually came before the Venera one I was just looking because somewhere it said this was actually Sputnik 8 or something and I was wondering okay what is Sputnik 3 then and it's sort of this cone shaped craft and it was just really more science from you know the magnetic fields around the earth and so on so we're gonna skip this one for now or forever I don't know we'll see because we can't do everything so anyway there is the Vostok rocket so I was looking up somewhere it spoke about the Venera Samolnia uh, had a upper stage that somehow had a relation to the Vostok as well. I guess it's the same upper stage. Just see here. Wait, or somewhere here. The third stage had to follow closely the diameter of the Vostok third stage. Therefore, it could only be increased from the Vostok's 2. Point whatever meters to 2.66 meters. You see, so I can't increase the stuff by 10 centimeters. I don't use tweak scale here. The third new stage was developed from the uh, first developed for the Molnia and so on. So this is in maybe an upper stage that we can use for the Vostok as well. But we'll get into that later. So let's just design this one specifically for Venera. So look at all these dogs. Shame these are the other animals. They use Belka and Strelka. But I think they came back alive. If I'm not mistaken. Some dogs flew more than once. Um, so, yes, is there anything else? Any last words? I don't think so. Just double check here. So there, yes, it does look a, like a very long upper stage, really. If we just look at the... Where did I see that again? This one, I guess. The upper stage is almost basically as long as the part that sticks out above the boosters there. And then of course it has this upper stage, which or the, the top stage, the third or technically fourth stage, but we'll look at that anyway. So let's just get back into the game and jump in. So I've saved this anyway as, as Luna 4, even though this was Luna 3A. So we'll just uh, start now from scratch. So for this one, I'm thinking we're going to have to use a better probe core. Something maybe with built-in reaction control system that is going to sort of simulate the gyroscope thing to an extent. This one may be a bit too big, actually. Anyway, if we just look at the cylinder, I think this again will have to do. It's again following on from the Luna 3, but... Uh, it sort of matches, it's about the same height as the width, which is more or less what the pictures look like. So I think actually no, this pro core won't do. We're gonna need one of the octos. Let's just take the first level one. And actually for this I'm probably gonna clip it inside the tank, because this is now not a fuel tank. This is all the instrumentation and all of that, so it's perfectly allowable. And the reason I really want to do that is because I want to sort of recreate that area. Or maybe we should leave it. I don't know. We'll see. Let's just put the battery on. We need a battery, of course. Something like that. And then the hemisphere is now the another probe core, probably. 
which is of course the Staputnik, but uh, we need that SAS and the slight reaction wheel. This one of course doesn't have that. Now, is there any other option for that sphere? We had the same problem with the lunar or moonar impactor and that one is too small given the scale. So it has to be this one. So all I'm going to do with this is I'm going to move this one a bit down so that it sort of sits into the area here. Again, this is in, you know, okay, this was the pennant that was supposed to float in the ocean, but we'll say it's an instrumentation unit. I know that doesn't, that waviness I want to try and avoid, so it will probably have to be like that. That doesn't look bad. Then let's just move this up because it's not, you know, it's floating in mid-air. Something like that. That looks nice. Now, if we just have a look again, 